Hi everybody, it's Inga. We're going to start our discussion for the NUR 2030 fall semester with chapter nine. And this is the section on the general survey, measurement of patients and obtaining vital signs. In order to get the most from your book, in chapter nine, the information is presented mostly in the objective data form. So pay attention to the normal and abnormal findings. In the measurement and vital signs section, read the practice procedure tips in the normal range column on things like how to take accurate vital signs. And since you cannot treat what you don't find or know, obtaining accurate and complete histories and vital signs are really essential to good patient assessment in creating your nursing plan. So you need to know how to perform all of the skills in this chapter for clinical and for your exams. Review the information on culture and genetics and the documentation and critical thinking portion of the book, and then read and review the pictures in the abnormal findings section and learn about the health promotion techniques listed at the end of the chapter. So let's begin. When you walk into a room, the first thing that you notice is the patient's overall appearance, body structure, if they're standing or walking, their mobility, and their behavior. You may not have put those specific terms to what you were doing before, but this is called the general survey, and these are the things that you're assessing. So the steps of the general survey include looking at physical appearance to determine if the patient appears their stated age, looking or asking the person um, about their gender identity, so do you identify as male, female, or other, and using the appropriate pronouns, determining mental status, and so that would be AVPU and Glasgow Coma Scale, looking at the patient's skin color for clues of illness, so if they're jaundice, then you'd be concerned about a liver or biliary problem. If they have pallor, you'd be concerned about blood loss or shock, poor perfusion. If they have cyanosis, you're concerned about hypoxia. And if they have ruber or erythema, you're concerned about infection, or vasodilation, right? Um, look at their overall facial features. Do you notice um, asymmetry? You know, do they have normal movement of the face? Uh, and then abnormal or overgrowth or really kind of uh, coarse facial features could be indicators of a genetic um, abnormality. Your gut is going to tell you what their overall appearance is. Are they acutely distressed, moderate distressed, no acute distress? And it's really important that you chart that because if somebody goes in 20 minutes later and the patient is acutely distressed, it's super helpful to know that 20 minutes ago they were in no acute distress or just mild or moderate distress and what you did about it. Then look at their body structure. What is their overall stature? How well is their nutrition? Are they symmetrical? What type of posture do they assume? How are they positioned? And are they able to do it themselves or do they require, you know, propping? Um, what is their overall body build and their muscular contour? And then are there any obvious deformities? So for myself, the emergency room, for a traumatic patient, I see a lot of deformities. But for somebody who lives in, let's say, long-term care, who has a long-term disease, they may also experience other deformities, such as contractures, Somebody may have been born with a congenital deformity, or somebody may have residual deformities for something like a stroke. As the patient moves or walks, examine their gait and look at the full range of motion of their joints. Examine their behavior. Look at their facial expressions. Can they maintain eye contact? Look at their mood and their affect. The mood is the what way that the person reports that they're feeling, like I feel happy, I feel sad, 
and the affect is the facial expression that they're demonstrating to the world. We'll talk about this more in mental health, but a mismatch of mood and affect, so a patient who says, I feel happy but looks very angry, is a key indicator of violence. A person who has a mismatch of mood and affect has a high likelihood of striking out or hitting the healthcare provider. Speech and speech patterns should be examined for things like depression, um, anxiety, mania, and then look at their overall dress and their hygiene. Are they able to care for themselves? Do you have any concerns? When you're measuring your patients, it's important to note that there are different techniques used for infants from birth to 24 months than there are for adults. For both height and weight, over the age of two years can be measured standing as long as there's no assistive devices required. Under the age of two years, so birth to 24 months, both height and weight are measured using special devices. So height is measured um, supine in a horizontal plane. So really we're measuring length and weight is measured using a platform scale. Remember, if you're using any sort of uh, special device like a walker, a cane, a wheelchair, um, that you zero the scale with the device on it and then weigh the patient with uh, in the device. Once you've obtained height and weight, you can calculate BMI or body mass index. 18.5 to 24.9 is normal. The calculation for body mass index is weight in pounds divided by height squared or height in inches squared, or um, if you want to use the metric system, weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. In your book on page 131, you can actually find uh, the BMI chart and you can review um, kind of height versus weight and where those uh, BMI calculations would fall. When you're obtaining vital signs, there's a lot of critical thinking that goes into this. So some of you may have started off at the LNA level and now our LPNs, now working up to the RN level. And at each level, we talk a little bit more about the importance of vital signs. At the LNA level, you may have felt very comfortable and confident obtaining you know, um, vital signs using a automatic machine on every single patient, using a tympanic thermometer on every single patient, um, and just reporting abnormals without maybe even confirming them when you were first starting out. At the RN level, one of the things that's really critical is that you think to yourself or you question, um, what is the correct route for me to take a temperature? You know, uh, is this child old enough to have a tympanic temperature taken? Or should I, you know, use a temporal artery? Are they ill enough that I really should do a rectal because that's going to give me a core temperature? And does the risk of a rectal temperature outweigh or, you know, or do the benefits of getting that core temperature outweigh the risk of doing the rectal really is the question. Um, so look at the age and the overall condition and then choose the correct route. There are patients that are going to have absolute contraindications to rectal temperatures, especially patients who are neutropenic, because if you tear the rectal mucosa, they can get an abscess and become septic and die. So thinking about just overall, um, you know, health is important as well. When you are obtaining a pulse, you want to think about the rate, the rhythm, the force, so the strength of those pulses, and then the location that you obtained them in. You would never just try to palpate a radial pulse and say, well, there's no pulse and move on, right? So then you would come more proximal and more proximal, so attempt a brachial pulse, um, and then attempt a carotid pulse, right? Same with pedal pulses. If you couldn't find a pedal pulse, you would attempt a popliteal and then ephemeral. And if none of that worked, you would obviously use a Doppler to make sure that there was some perfusion. 
but you can also use alternative confirmation methods, right? So is the skin pink? Is it warm? Does it have adequate cap refill? Sometimes pulses are just very difficult to palpate for whatever reason. So look for other confirmations of perfusion. If somebody has what you think is a nice strong pulse, but they have, you know, pale or cyanotic or cold extremities, they, you know, use those critical thinking skills. Do they really have good perfusion? Respirations, you want to count the rate, the depth, and the effort. Um, or, you know, kind of guess at the effort. How hard are they working to breathe? Effort would include things like how many words can they speak at a time? Can they speak in full sentences or just two to three words at a time? Are they using accessory muscles? Are they using tripod positioning? Do you hear any um, adventitious breath sounds? For depth, one of the things that we're really concerned with is whether or not there's adequate depth. So remember in the adult, an adult has about 150 milliliters of physiologic dead space. So the first 150 milliliters of air that you're inhaling and exhaling is not actually being exchanged between the environment and the body. So if they're not breathing deeply, if they're breathing rapidly and shallowly, they may not actually be exchanging carbon dioxide or oxygen. With blood pressure, you want to measure the systolic and the diastolic, calculate the mean arterial pressure, and know how to take orthostatic vital signs. So um, evidence-based practice has changed regarding orthostatic vital signs recently. The current recommendation is that you put the patient in the supine position and you wait two to three minutes. You check their blood pressure and their heart rate at rest in that supine position. And then you either sit the patient up or stand the patient up and wait a minute and then again check their blood pressure and their heart rate and you're looking for any drop in blood pressure greater than 20 systolic or any increase in heart rate greater than 20 beats per minute. Um, and we'll talk more about that but really uh, you may have learned orthostatic vital signs differently. When uh, I first learned them we had to do them supine uh, seated and standing. We had to wait five minutes in between each one so at a bare minimum it took 20 minutes to obtain a set of orthostatic vital signs. Oxygen saturation so this can be obtained by using a sticker or can be obtained by using um, a, you know, like an alligator clip probe. This is a non-invasive technique where a red light is shown through um, one side of the finger and then picked up on the other side and it's determined on how red that light still is. So it is used to establish a baseline and determine whether or not therapy is effective. The limitations, however, of oxygen saturation are that the uh, body part that you're testing has to be well perfused. If the patient is moving, so let's say you put it on their finger and they're tapping their finger, it's not going to work. If the hands are cold, it won't work. If the device is in direct sunlight, it won't work. Um, and if they have blue or metallic nail polish on, it will also impair the device reading properly. The other thing that's important to note is it's just measuring color, it's not measuring oxygen. And uh, hemoglobin is red anytime anything is bound to it. So if uh, carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin, so somebody has carbon monoxide poisoning, their pulse oximetry or the, you know, the oxygen saturation number is oftentimes very high, even 100% even though their actual oxygen level may only be 50 or 60. So there are definitely some times where you get a false reading. One of the things that you want to do is make sure that you put it on a nice warm perfused extremity and that you look to make sure that the pleth, so the waveform that goes along with the pulse oximeter or the rate that's reading on the pulse oximeter matches the actual pulse rate on that extremity. And that will help you determine whether or not you're getting an um, appropriate or accurate reading. So let's talk for a minute about blood pressure. 
The systolic blood pressure is the top sound that you hear, and that's an indication or reflection of the maximum pressure against the arterial wall during left ventricular systole. So remember the left ventricle is really the work force of the heart. It's the, the strongest pump within the heart. So of all four chambers, the left ventricle pumps the hardest. So it creates the greatest force. And um, the systolic blood pressure is the, the peak force that's applied to the inside of the arterial wall uh, during systole. Then after ventricular systole, remember the heart relaxes and it fills passively. So that's called diastole and all four chambers are filling at the same time. So the diastolic pressure is the bottom sound or the lowest sound, last sound that you hear. And that's the resting arterial pressure during cardiac diastole. So during the diastolic phase, when the heart is completely at rest and passive filling is occurring, the diastolic sound that you hear, the last beat that you hear in the blood pressure is an indication of how much back pressure there is or how much force there is at rest against the arterial walls. The heart spends about two thirds of the cardiac cycle in diastole and about one third in systole. And there's really good evidence to demonstrate that when we're looking at hypertension, it's really the diastolic or that constant back pressure that is of greatest concern for things like aneurysms, heart disease, vascular disease, strokes, heart attack. Um, so really that diastolic number, you wanna make sure you're getting a good reading. And a lot of times I'll see people get the systolic number and as long as the systolic number is good, they just kind of like rapidly deflate the cuff or they don't really pay attention. And that diastolic number is probably more important. The pulse pressure is the difference between systolic and diastolic. So you literally just subtract the diastolic from the systolic. So if your blood pressure <clears throat> is 120 over 80, then you subtract 80 from 120 and your pulse pressure would be 40. And this is a reflection of stroke volume. And that 40 doesn't correlate to any specific amount of volume, but as your pulse pressure gets smaller, so if my blood pressure then were to drop to uh, 110 over 82 because I was bleeding out and now my pulse pressure is only, or, yeah, sorry, my pulse pressure is only 28. Um, that means that I've lost a significant amount of volume. So one of the things that we look at is um, narrowing pulse pressure versus widening pulse pressure. So somebody who's in <clears throat> heart failure that has a large cardiac output is going to have a wide uh, pulse pressure or a large pulse pressure. And somebody who is uh, in like cardiac tamponade, who has a tension pneumothorax, or who's in hypovolemic shock is going to have a very narrow pulse pressure. This is a critical concept, and this is the mean arterial pressure. And this is something that I'm going to nag you about for, I don't know, like the next 10 months of your life. Um, the mean arterial pressure is the average blood pressure during the cardiac cycle. So again, the heart spends two times the um, amount of time in diastole. So it takes more time to refill than it does to empty because refilling is passive and emptying is an active process. It's kind of like inhalation, exhalation. So mean arterial pressure can be calculated two thirds the diastolic plus one third the systolic or um, two times the diastolic plus the systolic divided by three. However you like to do your math, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, there's a lot of different equations out there. Why is this important? It's important for so many reasons. Um, you have to have a mean arterial pressure of at least 60 to perfuse your heart, at least 65 to perfuse your brain, um, and then you know from there upward. So anytime you're taking care of somebody and you notice that their mean arterial pressure is dropping, that means that their vital organs are at risk of no longer being perfused. When you are using an automatic blood pressure cuff, it actually only calculates mean arterial pressure and then applies a mathematical formula to give you a systolic and diastolic. It doesn't actually hear the systolic and diastolic. So um, when you're inputting that into the computer, when you're using an automatic cuff, it's really critical that you input the mean arterial pressure because when you're looking at trends as an RN, what you really need to be trending is the map and not the systolic and diastolic. So I really wanna see you in clinical paying attention to the map or the mean arterial pressure. That is a critical concept and you will save lives if you recognize that the map is falling. 
in your book, this is a, I think it's on page 138, it is. This is a, a great uh, visual representation of the factors that make a difference in blood pressure. So blood pressure is uh, cardiac output times peripheral vascular resistance, and cardiac output is made up of heart rate times stroke volume. So essentially blood pressure is the effect of heart rate times stroke volume times peripheral vascular resistance. So what does that mean? How fast I'm beating, how much volume I'm putting through, and how much squeeze I have on the end. So if I am vasoconstricted, it's gonna raise my blood pressure. If I have a larger stroke volume, it's gonna raise my blood pressure. And if I increase my heart rate, it's gonna raise my blood pressure. If my heart rate slows down, my blood pressure is gonna go down. If my stroke volume falls, my blood pressure is gonna go down. And if I vasodilate, my blood pressure is going to go down. So this is just a beautiful, again, visual representation. It's on page 138 in your textbook. And this, again, is just another critical concept because as you are assessing your patient and you notice that the blood pressure is going up or down, these are the things you need to be thinking of uh, because these are the three mechanisms that we have to lower or raise blood pressure. Hence the reason we use the drugs that we use. All right, now, last but not least, be sure to review the abnormals in the back of your chapter. So what is this? What is the clinical significance of this finding? And we can discuss that in class. See you guys on Monday.